Today I will be talking to Matt Malone, who is a student at Cambridge University uh, studying for MPhil in linguistics. Um, hi Matt. Hello. <laughs> so, uh, how are you finding uh, Cambridge? Cambridge is great. Um, I'm from the US. I'm from New York originally and lived there my entire life until I moved to Cambridge about six months ago now. And it's nice, it's very different, uh, different pace of life, but tons of brilliant people around every corner, which is very exciting. And yeah, so I'm enjoying myself. That's great. Um, so um, you said you're from New York. Did you do your uh, undergrad in, in New York as well? Yes, so I grew up um, in Manhattan and then I went to undergrad there about 30 minutes from where I lived my entire life. So very local, um, small range of movement in my life so far. Mm -hmm. And what was your, um, how does the undergraduate or college system in the, in the US work? Like, did you do your undergrad also in linguistics or, or do you, do you focus on something during undergrad or how does that work? So how it worked in my university, I went to Columbia University and um, the linguistics program was very small, but it existed. It was actually um, embedded within the Russian department. No one really knew why. <laughs> um, and it was really to give an overview of what linguistics is, which is kind of a, I would say, interesting, maybe weird field just because it's kind of a lots of little subtopics that you would focus in. It's not something like history where you're kind of doing the same thing no matter which subfield you're um, focusing on. Maybe historians would disagree with me about that, but there are so many different kind of offshoots of linguistics that you can get into, and they're very drastically different. Um, but the purpose of the undergrad program at Columbia was just to familiarize yourself with all of them. So the requirements I had to take were the main things you might be interested in within language and the idea being that by the end you will have focused in on something in particular and then maybe do a master's or something like that um, where you can focus more so on that topic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what, what were the subfields that you were that you were introduced to? Did you like, I don't know, give some examples about the subfields that you had to take For or sure. what you liked more? Yeah. Um, so my required courses were phonetics, phonology, um, syntax, uh, I actually didn't have to take any semantics, but I think most people consider that a pretty prominent field in linguistics. Um, morphology was a bit embedded in all of the other topics. Um, and then from there you had to take electives. So some of the options were, uh, languages of Africa, you could take computational linguistics, you could take uh, language documentation. And so it's kind of just like a hodgepodge of different things. And uh, what were my favorites? I loved syntax. I actually didn't take computational linguistics, even though that's what I'm focusing on right now. Um, and I liked how technical it felt. I come from more of like a math background, at least in high school. And I didn't realize that linguistics was as logic-based as it ended up being. Um, and so I liked the fields that involved more kind of logical thinking as opposed to, um, I don't know, um, humanities-based analysis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes, makes perfect sense. So you said that in Colombia there was no like linguistics program that yours was part of uh, a Russian studies did you mm -hmm. say yeah and that you had a maths background so how did you end up with maths background without in a university that doesn't have a linguistics degree studying linguistics it's a good question um, I went in to undergrad thinking I was going to be an English literature major who knows why. Um, I, the nice thing about US universities, I think, is that 
there's really no immediate pressure whatsoever to figure out exactly what you're studying. And there's, for most universities, uh, lots of flexibility as to when you finally determine that and what classes you take at the beginning. Um, so yeah, I came from a math background in high school, but figured that would be too difficult to do as a major. And so I said, okay, what's my second favorite subject, which was English, um, fiction, usually. And um, it was, I took a bunch of courses in it and loved it, but kind of stumbled upon linguistics just because I knew I liked learning languages in high school and took the class on a whim my sophomore year, so second year. And then immediately knew this was the thing that I wanted to do because it had kind of all of the elements of the things I liked in a context that was way more what I would describe as like on earth than math or something like that because I felt like with math classes you just always ended up in the clouds it was very abstract and there was not a lot of grounding force but linguistics allowed you to use that same kind of tools in your brain in the same way while talking about people and things that I'm doing right now and on a daily basis, um, which I thought was so cool. And I've been doing linguistics ever since. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, so if someone asks you what you study or what is linguistics or do, like, does your family or do your family and friends, do they understand what you're studying or what is linguistics? I just find that, well, because linguistics is not part, usually part of like school sort of subjects and people find it maybe a little bit later in life and for linguists obviously it's it's obvious but I have like found that I think that my family and friends have very different uh, idea of what I am doing than like what I am actually doing do you have a <laughs> I certainly find that yeah M most people when they hear that I'm doing linguistics the next question is not what do you focus on but what is linguistics So what really is linguistics? And I feel like I still don't really have a good answer to that question. I usually say that, well, you break down language into all of the components that are involved and then you can focus on one or two of them, kind of as I described earlier, um, which I do think is true, but I wish I had like a catchy way of just describing the field overall in like one or two sentences that was like punchy. Um, but I think it's true, it's kind of, um, you can focus on such an array of different things and end up in a um, in a phonetic studio like focusing on the pitch of one's voice or the vocal tract and then you might end up in something that's way closer to biology than say sociolinguistics where you're studying language maybe change over time in communities which is really not so biologically focused at all and so it's I kind of think of it as like language as applied to X is the field of linguistics where X can pretty much be anything. Um, that is like the unifying thing about linguistics. So yes, people are definitely confused when I tell them that I do linguistics. Um, probably for the reasons you said, it's not one of the core subjects that you're taught in uh, elementary school when you're growing up, unlike something like math or really any science, um, history, English, that kind of stuff. But it's wonderful, and I think people actually really enjoy it when I give kind of an explanation for what it is, because people tend, as far as in my experience, to associate linguistics or language with humanities-based topics, and so they expect, I think, that I'm studying something like um, language in novels or something like that, and really it's way more of um, anything you want it to be. So it doesn't have to be very bookish. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, I completely agree. Like I've started saying uh, language stuff. Because like, <laughs> <people, like, laughs> I think it's like everything to do with language and it's just, I can't really describe it. And I, I'll just say language stuff. Basically like language applied to X, which is much more sophisticated. Do you think that's punchy? That should be my 
one sentence that I'd describe. Like language people. applied to X sounds like very like it sounds definitely more like serious than language <laughs> stuff. I mean, because <laughs> I guess linguistics is kind of like struggling of like I don't know to be recognized as real science. So mm-hmm. maybe language mm-hmm. applied to X sounds more sciencey, yeah, right? You have a variable in there. It sounds uh-huh, that's all you uh-huh. need. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, another question that I get asked often when I say I study linguistics is, well, the first question for me is usually how many languages mm-hmm. do you speak? Mm-hmm. Have you, mm-hmm. have you got that? That is definitely, if not the most common, the second most common mm-hmm. question that I get. And I'm so embarrassed to say really the answer is one. Um, because even though I've taken courses and even in some cases lived in countries where the language, the foreign language I've taken is spoken, um, albeit briefly, I don't feel natural speaking in any language other than English. Um, but the ones I usually say just to please people and also maybe make myself look a little bit better is French and Spanish because I have many years of practice in those. Um, I took a bit of Russian, which I enjoyed a lot, a lot of mathematical thinking and logic to be done in a very complex language if you're coming from an English perspective. Um, I took one semester of Japanese, which was great, and I wish I had more practice in that. Um, But now I'm focusing on Swahili, which is kind of my new obsession. And it's a beautiful language with a lot of interesting things coming from English. That's that's a lot of languages. But only bits and pieces. Okay, okay. Conversationally, if you dropped me in Kenya or Japan or Moscow, I'd be lost and I couldn't okay, okay. find my way. <laughs> yeah, but like to be clear, like in linguistics, you don't necessarily like have to do research that is based on that acquires like like knowing five languages, right? So just to to be clear, because for example, I speak well, my native language is Estonian, but I speak English, but uh, I don't really know any other languages. <laughs> like um, so, it is possible to do research in linguistics and get into linguistics without necessarily enjoying learning languages, which is it's great that you did, but I think also many people like don't. I think that's definitely true. I mean, in my MPhil course, there's at least five people who speak one language and study that language. And that's totally acceptable. And yeah, that shouldn't be a turn off at all if people are considering studying linguistics. But of course, it's it's uh, it's great to have other other languages, but is possible uh, also without that. But you said that you have um, lived in um, in a country where the language that you learned was spoken. So what was that? Yeah, I don't know how you define live, but I was in uh, Paris for two months, one summer of undergrad, um, where I attempted to learn French. And it definitely got better, but... I found that in Paris, when you (laughs) attempt to speak French with a native speaker, if they can detect that you are an English speaker, they tend to just automatically speak English to facilitate a conversation if I'm getting ice cream or something like that. Which makes sense, but also (laughs) I didn't get to actually practice that much, but um, (laughs) that was great. I also did research in my undergrad in Cameroon where I had to use my French, but also um, did a language documentation project in which Bapuku, which was an endangered language, is an endangered language, is still alive, um, is spoken. And so my Bapuku was kind of being practiced there a little bit. And can't say I'm fluent by any means, but um, when you're spending that much time around the language, definitely you pick up some definitely uh so the project in cameroon that sounds very interesting that sounds like a linguist's uh, dream or that when you i think when you start studying linguistics then you think oh this is what i'm gonna do i'm gonna mm-hmm. document endangered languages but i haven't actually okay i met like some professors who do that but i haven't actually met any students who who actually do that before you so um do you want to uh, talk a little bit, little bit about how you get into this um, 
this research, which is like for an undergrad research project, going to Cameroon, documenting languages. That's like exciting, super super cool project. Um, you know, how did you how did you end up with this? Or? Yeah, um, it was definitely exciting. I definitely had no idea what I was doing, <laughs> and have no idea how people allowed me to go there to begin with. Um, one semester in undergrad, my um, third year, first semester. I took, at the same time, a language documentation class, which was all about field methods and how to, um, how to document a language from the ground up. And that was a fascinating class because we had a speaker come in every class and she spoke a language called Zazaki, which is, um, most speakers are in modern day Turkey. And no one knew the language. And so as a class, collectively, we just asked how to say words in the language and then sentences and then elicited texts and so basically tried to describe and understand the language having no background whatsoever so we had no grammar or dictionary we just had a, a bilingual speaker of English and Sazaki which was the coolest academic experience I've probably had in a classroom setting um, and I simultaneously took a class on languages of Africa and I loved both of those two so much that I said, okay, how can I combine these? And I asked my professor and he said, well, I happen to have a friend who um, does exactly that and studies endangered languages in Africa and does a lot of uh, description and documentation projects there. Why don't you talk to him? And so I did. And he said, there's this one language called Bapuku in Cameroon that I uh, learned or didn't learn, but it interacted with briefly on a trip which was planned for documenting a different language. And he says, as far as I know, very little research, if any, has been done on it. Would you like to go and do that? And I was like, yeah, it would, like you say, it's like the linguist's dream to be able to go to places and learn new languages. And it's really exciting to not have any background whatsoever on it. But I was definitely uh, <laughs> underprepared, to say the least. There are so many things which I think now I should have done when I was there, um, but amazing and inspired me to do everything that I've done since and is probably the reason why I'm here now. Um, but I went by myself. I told myself after applying to this uh, fund for global projects, basically as an undergraduate, if I get this funding, I have to go and I can't be afraid and I'm just gonna do it and it'll be by myself. And I was somewhat hoping that I was not gonna get the funding just because I was really nervous <laughs> to do it. But I did, I was lucky enough to get it. And so I said, okay, I guess I'm going to Cameroon. And then my mom was very nervous and she was like, where is Cameroon? <laughs> and I had just looked it up on a map. And so I knew exactly where to point. Um, but I went for six weeks um, before my final year of undergrad and had a few contacts going in, but not many. My French was decent, but not great. And this was in a French speaking portion of Cameroon, so no English. Um, and eventually built a network there and people were very, very excited to take part in the process. Um, everyone was, both aware of the fact that people were speaking the language less and less and very eager to get some materials out of it. So if you could get a, something close to a dictionary or a grammar sketch, people were excited by that idea. And so for six weeks, I sat and spoke with the same two speakers um, who probably were very annoyed with me by the end because I kept on asking the same questions over and over again. Um, and eventually feel like I got a decent idea of what the language looked like overall and ended up writing my senior thesis for undergrad on the language and the languages change over time. Sorry, that was a mouthful, uh, but that was the whole story from beginning to end. Very, very exciting. Like, sounds super cool. It was cool. <laughs> Is that also like uh, why you chose to uh, continue like graduate um, education? Like 
that, that you had such an exciting research project going on or did this like affect your decision or did you know like all the way that you want to do a master's and you want to keep studying? It was pretty much entirely decided by that research project. I think I was interested in linguistics for sure, but never thought I was going to be anything close to an academic, not that I am an academic now, but um, I didn't think I was going to do any further degrees. But after that, I was like, wow, research can be so fun, <laughs> surprisingly, but it was. And why did you decide to continue this, uh, like your studies here? In Cambridge so you knew you wanna you want to keep studying it why why Cambridge Cambridge because as I mentioned I lived in the same uh, 20 block radius of New York City for 22 years and I was very eager to go abroad or at least leave New York get out of my comfort zone and I looked up best linguistics <laughs> graduate programs and Cambridge was one of the top ones and I said, okay, that's in the UK, and they speak a language that I feel comfortable with, and I applied, and now I'm here. Is it common for from like for people from US to come to UK or anywhere abroad after like uh, college, or did your course mates also choose to, or friends choose to go abroad to study? Um, a few, but it's not super common. Mm. I think not many people do master's programs coming straight out of undergrad to mm -hmm. begin with, let alone PhD programs, um, at least from my university. And the ones who do tend to stay in the US um, for a bunch of reasons. It makes sense, friends and family nearby for the most part. Um, but yeah, I just had strong wanderlust and wanted to live somewhere <laughs> else to see what that was like. And so I did. <laughs> so you said like before going to uh, Cameroon, you were uh, a bit nervous, scared. Uh, was it similar like coming here or here it was easy? No. I was still a little bit nervous to be honest. I just I I felt like I had such little practice in making friends, <laughs> and <laughs> so I came and. Luckily, things came naturally just because there were so many orientation programs. And being in a university setting makes that so much easier. Yeah, because definitely. I would imagine if I were to just go to, I don't know, London or some city and just start working, it would be very hard to find a community. But uh, Cambridge is very conducive to that, so that was helpful. And I was nervous, but not nearly as nervous as I was to be in a country where... Um, English wasn't a commonly spoken language or all of these other things and um, yeah and did you have any like expectations before coming to Cambridge what were you like where I come from I think it's sort of like wow like top I don't know dream school or like there's like very I think unrealistic or or sort of like people think about this place as something I don't know super amazing which it is it is nice but I mean, feel like there are a lot of expectations uh, surrounding like this sort of place in Cambridge University and all that like this I don't know did, did you have any what did you think about it before coming here or what did you know or yeah definitely um I didn't know very much I didn't know anyone who had um studied at Cambridge I didn't know anyone really who was attending with me and so I just kind of gathered all my information from online. I had been to London once before, but London is nothing like Cambridge. And I definitely had and continue to have imposter syndrome where I feel as though everyone deserved to get into this school and this program, but I did not. And I was a fluke in the system and I don't know why they accepted me, but I'm just kind of floating by and pretending as though I belong like everyone else does. Um, but it's nice to know other people feel that way too. And other people have talked with me about it and it's made me feel much more at home. Yeah, imposter syndrome has definitely been talked about a lot here. And yeah, for the last few days I've been uh, 
talking a lot about how this uh, I probably this is a mistake like I think everyone else is <laughs> feeling the imposter syndrome and knows that it's the imposter syndrome but I am actually <laughs> like you know they're just thinking but I actually am uh, an imposter so yeah I feel the same way how do you how do you deal with these emotions like how do you I don't know how do you get over it how do you keep working or socializing or how do you keep over get over imposter syndrome I don't know that I have <laughs> <laughs> I think I still am feeling it. But things that help is trying to separate um, like the impressiveness of someone's work from the uh, interestingness of someone's work. That doesn't really make sense. But what I mean is that rather than responding to someone saying, yeah, I went to this conference and they talked about this thing that no one has ever studied before and wow I got these amazing results and whatever um, being turned off by why haven't I done that more just taking that as a learning experience to learn about the cool things that everyone else has done so I've just tried to stop um, like measuring people's success and just like listening to it and that's so inspirational you know um because like I said there are brilliant people around every corner and everyone is doing something so fascinating in its own right and if you can focus on kind of the content as opposed to like the, the like impressive I don't know impressive nature of what they're doing that has helped so I think I've developed a and appreciation for a lot of different academic subjects. And if you just sit down and actually listen to what people are doing from the ground up, it might take kind of a long time to understand, given that people are doing really complex things. But at the end of the day, it's really exciting. It's, everyone has their own TED talk to give to you, yeah. you know, which is so fun. Yeah, I definitely completely agree with that thing here in Cambridge. Well, um, like, I feel that on the linguistics course and well in all the other courses as well probably the thing with Cambridge is that um, the professors or your teachers uh, they've been people who you used to cite like for me I feel like I knew their work before I knew them and I'm not sure if I can handle this like <laughs> you know talking to them and uh, I think similarly to what you said I just thought that okay, I can't handle it anyway so I'll just forget about that I'll just talk to them as if they were people and uh, I don't know like how do you have you felt this way like uh, or, or how do you how do you handle that when you're a professor or someone that says like people that you really look up to but you still have to talk to them so there's a weird like celebrity culture with academics and professors where you know that their work is loved and that you've loved and read their work before and it's totally weird, you're so right, to be sitting in a room with someone, asking them questions, and sometimes they'll ask you questions, and you're like, why are you, you know the answer to this stuff, I don't know the answer to this stuff. And it's, it's a great experience, because it makes you realize that everyone is a person at the end of the day, and you can't specialize in everything. So whenever a professor will say to me, well, that's not really my field, so you probably know as much about this as I do. In my head, I'll think that's definitely not true, but in reality, it might be true. Um, it's it's so inspiring at the end of the day to be around people who are so knowledgeable in something, but it's comforting to know that that something is kind of well-defined and that beyond that, you have to find your thing that you're going to be a specialist in. And that will be your contribution to academia. And collectively, that's what knowledge is. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it can totally be intimidating. But um, it's the same kind of thing with imposter syndrome, where if you can separate um, the, the inspirational like, content of what they're saying as opposed to just like the grandeur of their presence and their reputation or whatever, that's a helpful tactic. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you talked about specialization and that people can specialize in, in everything. Uh, and before you said that 
you didn't take computational, which you're focusing on now. Mm -hmm. So you have sort of changed your area of uh, spe speciality, mm -hmm. linguist. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, and you. So tell us a little bit about what are you studying here? What what are you specializing on, or what are the courses? Yeah. Sure. Um, so specializing in computational linguistics, um, I had never taken a class in it. Uh, the undergrad course required coding practice, which I had some of, but it was very intimidating for me. And so I didn't want to end up in a course where I had no idea how to literally speak the language that everyone else was speaking. And so, um, luckily at Cambridge, um, the computational linguistics focus doesn't require any coding experience whatsoever, which I think is great because it's a good gateway into a field that can be a little bit scary if you don't have that basic um, skill. And so they give you a really good background in all kinds of things that you can use computational linguistics for. And that was in a lecture. And now we're taking a seminar, which is more focused and goes into a bit more detail. And from which I decided my topic for my thesis, which will be on Swahili. Um, and what I'll be doing is basically creating a resource, a very useful resource that exists in computational linguistics, but only for languages. I think it exists for English, German, Russian, and Italian. But I'm going to translate it into Swahili and then do some tests on it. And then this resource will be used to make things like machine translation and semantic networks, which I can go into if you want me to, <laughs> um, for the language. But basically all these things that are useful for any kind of natural language processing task um, in the future. Okay, so what is this uh, resource? Or, like, how do you do that? So what it is is a list of word pairs and so in English mm -hmm. it'll just say it's, it's literally a list so say old new and then the next one might be um, young childish and the next one might be stupid foolish but they're not all adjectives they go into nouns and verbs and so on mm -hmm. and the useful the use of this list is that people then um, participants will rate the similarity of the two words on the list. So with something like old and new, if you're rating it on a scale of zero to 10, you might give that a zero. But with something like childish and young, you might give that a four, five, six, something like that. And then you have pairs like smart and intelligent, which I, if I were rating it, would probably give that a nine, maybe a ten. So it's how similar they are. How similar the words are. Mm. How, in, the, in the sense that um, how easily could you replace one word for the other and keep the same meaning of the sentence. Um, and there's a distinction that I feel like is worth noting, if not just to be interesting, but also uh, like important for the task specifically that I'm doing, between semantic similarity and semantic relativity or relations um so when you think about words like clothes and closet those two are in the same semantic field for sure of things people wear or putting on clothes or whatever so they're semantically related to one another but in terms of that substitution thing i was talking about you can't substitute closet for clothes and have a sentence carry the same meaning so if i say i put my clothes on versus i put my closet on no one really, really understand what you were talking about if you said I put my closet on. So these are rating um, semantic similarity, replaceability between the words. And then once you have a sufficient amount of ratings, so you average them, and so if 15 people have filled out this kind of rating system between all these word pairs, there's about a thousand of them, um, then you can use that fact to basically evaluate models that try and measure the semantic relationship between words. So I don't know if that makes total sense, but it's basically a, a tester because you're um, 
taking human knowledge, human evaluations where the participants are reading the words and comparing it to what a computer would do naturally based on um, a large amount of data that they would receive. And if I've missed anything, please let me know and I can go into more detail. <laughs> How did you how did you find this topic? How did you like how did you come up with this? I think so um this is the, the the grander scheme of what I'm doing for my dissertation is to measure um in Swahili there are a bunch of noun classes. So if you know French or Spanish, you know that nouns can either be masculine or feminine or German they can be neuter also. But in Swahili there's not just two or three options, there's more like 20 which is shocking to most people because this is kind of a linguistic anomaly and only exists for the Bantu language family um, to this degree. And I find that totally fascinating. And there's disagreement about how um, semantically motivated these classes are. Some people say that, oh, this class um, only contains things that you can hold in your hand. And this class contains only things that have a certain long, thin shape. And this class contains all of the animals or whatever. And then there are people who say, no, that's not true at all. They're totally muddled. There's no coherence within a class whatsoever. And there's been no effort, as far as I've researched, to um, kind of quantitatively measure the semantic nature of any of these classes. So for my thesis, we will attempt to do this and use the resource that I described earlier to measure how accurate the, um, the basis is. But I didn't answer your question. And the answer to your question <laughs> is that I learned about semantic models or computational models for semantics in this computational linguistics seminar and was so inspired by that because I saw how it could be applied to Swahili and immediately went to my supervisor and said, I have this idea, what do you think? And she said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the full story. And I'm sorry if it was overwhelming, but I can, I can specify any details if necessary. <laughs> if you want to, yeah, go ahead. That way. Well, <laughs> I just, if, if anything is confusing, I feel like I've tried to explain this so many times, but... Um, it's not that it's a complicated project, it just involves a lot of definitions. Yeah. And so it can, can be kind of a mouthful. But the general premise is just that we are using a computational model to evaluate a long existing semantic question about Swahili. Which I think is cool because for so many decades, people had to just use their brains and then talking with people to answer this question. But now you can do it in a way where you can measure, actually quantitatively measure the, the, the truth behind this idea. Um, and obviously there's value to people going with their gut and saying, I feel as though this is the case for this noun class, but having some more implemented tool can be useful. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the gist. Very, very exciting project, just like your undergrad uh, undergrad project. So you said that it involves a lot of definitions. It also seems like the project really um, uh, involves a lot of different areas of linguistics, like you said, semantics, computational, well, um, language documentation, African languages. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel like? Um, has like any or, or what subjects or modules that you have taken either during undergrad or during your masters what have really like supported uh, you in the project that you're doing now hmm. interesting um, definitely that languages of Africa course kind of started it because I didn't know any African languages and didn't know how they were structured at all and this course um, went over all of the language families that exist in Africa and a basic structure of the languages. And I had learned English, French, and Russian before. And despite those languages being different from one another, they were definitely not different to the degree that Swahili is to English. And so that really opened my mind to what languages can look like and be. And so that was crucial. I would say that was like the number one inspiration behind what I'm doing right now. 
even though it was now at this point like four or five years ago and um and other than that definitely this computational linguistics module because from that I realized that I can kind of answer this question um use it using technology and things that people are doing today um and definitely the Swahili language course that I'm taking right now which has got piqued my interest in the language to begin with mm -hmm. you said that uh, well you're using computational linguistics and and you're in it like for the or you're using it or learning about it for the first time and that it can be uh, a scary field for linguists to get into so how do you feel is it um, it is scary <laughs> computational linguistics the way it has been presented to me is really not scary in a way that i appreciate so much i think that with any quantitative subject someone who identifies as a more qualitatively oriented person if that means you study humanities or that means you tend to get nervous when there are equations involved um That hasn't been me, but even so, I was nervous just to enter this field that is intimidating. It feels like it has like this brick wall around it where if you don't know uh, coding languages or have d deep background in computer science, that, that might be tricky to enter. Um, being able to take this route where you're not um, learning via the coding has been so nice, has been really, really helpful. And um, it's good to know that you can understand a quantitative subject without getting necessarily into the nitty gritty at first, you know? And sure, if you end up focusing on a specific project, then you'll need to learn that, but it'll make sense because you'll understand the motivation behind doing it. And then you won't kind of be learning something or using something without understanding why you're actually learning it or what can be used for. So research, I think, is great in that respect, as opposed to just learning courses in undergrad, because the application sometimes can be really unclear, especially in something like math, where um, you're learning it, but there's no kind of grounding force. You're not saying, I'm, not, I'm, I'm gonna use this specifically for this thing. But research, you come from the other angle, where you say, okay, I wanna do this, how can I actually do it? And so that's very helpful. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's I definitely agree with uh, with what you what you said. It's it's great to be like uh, presented uh, like the computational side of it without starting from maybe that technical part. Because maybe like if you use it in linguistics, I feel like you would sort of need the conceptual understanding of how and why you would use it I think at first more than you would maybe need the technical part which obviously is is, is great to have but I think also that I feel that it can come later <laughs> definitely yeah uh, so we talked about uh, computational linguistics uh, seminars and courses uh, so in Cambridge this MPhil course that you're taking this is a nine month course mm -hmm. and um your uh, like final project seems very uh, intense. Are there like any other courses that you need to take or that you, or have you only focused on your, on your thesis the whole time? No, so Cambridge makes a nine month program but other schools will make something closer to a three year program as far as I'm told. I think the average is two years but it can be extended to be longer and so they really push in a lot of information and a lot of familiarity quick um, which is difficult but I didn't really want to do anything that was longer than a year and so this was nine months which was even shorter which is great um, but how it worked the structure of it was the first term we took uh, sat in lectures and so we chose four fields that we wanted to focus on and also had a research methods course and a general linguistics course. So we were, I guess, in total in six different courses at that time, um, which was a lot. And we had to write essays for three of them. Oh, it, I guess eventually four. Um, but it, it was demanding, but it was the idea was to fill in the gaps of our linguistics background. So I had never taken a semantics course and then I took one uh, 
a lecture, which was fascinating and definitely answered a lot of questions that I had had in that hole in my education. And then for the second term, which we're in right now, you focus on two of those four classes to do these um, smaller master student only seminars. And mine were computational linguistics and syntax, um, which has turned out to be very difficult in a way that I didn't expect, but um, definitely enriching. And then the final term, we do only our thesis. So that's really nice because we have about three months, I think it is, to just work on our projects, which I'm very excited for because when you have all these other things going on, it's like, oh, uh, where should I be allotting my time? It's always a question of should I be focusing on this smaller but sooner assignment or should I be focusing on the big picture, which is coming up later, but also it requires so much more work. And so I like having to not make decisions and then when this term is over, I will not, and I will only know that I have to write my thesis, um, which will definitely be a lot of work, but at least it won't involve having to choose between that and something else to do. Yeah, definitely agree with, agree with this, this point. Uh, looking forward for the third. Uh, Very much third, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you said it's, uh, well, talk, we talked about it being like a much shorter course than maybe in other universities similar courses would be. Um, how have you found it like, like time-wise? Have you, have you felt that it's very intense or have you also had time to go out or be in societies or travel? Or how do you, how do you plan your time? Do you have any free time? I have, yes, I, there's, there's time to do other things um, despite it being intense. So I would say Yes, there is a lot of work, and the nice thing is that after that first term, you actually don't have that much time when you're needed to be in a certain place. So these seminars only meet once a week, and so you can do other things like um, extracurricular activities, societies, that kind of stuff that's very fun. And I think it would have been a shame if I went to England for a year and was kind of my face in books the whole time. And so the nice thing is that um, with this freedom of where you actually need to be, you can do your work remotely and still have time to join rowing or something like that. I don't do that, but <laughs> there are other things that I've done on the side and um, I'm very grateful to be able to do those despite having an intense course. So what have you done? What sort of activities or societies or? So I swam for a little bit. I really enjoy swimming, um, but ended last term. And I do stand-up comedy, which has been very fun, exploring the Cambridge scene, which is way more thriving than I thought it was going to be. Um, yeah, coming from New York, I was not expecting very much, but there are shows all the time. So I'll sign up to do shows, practice my stand-up um, maybe once every two weeks or something like that, a little bit, yeah. And um, have been traveling, went to Estonia, which was beautiful. Um, went to Dublin and Berlin, and it is still kind of unfathomable for me, like how cheap and easy it is to hop around Europe when you're in Europe. And I'm not used to that because it's not the case in the U.S. at all, where if you're in New York and you want to go to L.A. or Chicago or Miami or where, wherever, um, it's kind of an endeavor. Um, tickets are not very cheap at all, but here you can get super cheap tickets. And so I've been taking advantage of that by going on kind of weekend trips, four-day, five-day trips, and have some more coming up that I'm very excited about. It's great. Um, well, you compare it like living in in US and 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 here. Um, how would you or could you compare like the two universities or your studying experience in like Columbia and and Cambridge? Like, what are the similarities or what are the differences? Yeah, um, it's hard to tell sometimes whether it's a difference in terms of the level at which I'm studying. So whether 
it's a difference between undergraduate and postgraduate mm -hmm. or whether it's a US UK difference but from what I can gather from undergraduate lifestyle it seems as though the UK or Cambridge I should say um, puts a lot more onus on the student in terms of their independent study than Columbia did so with Columbia, you had tons of assignments, tons of little assignments where the professor would be, the professor or the TAs or whoever would be checking in on your work to understand that you're um, with where the course is going. So getting each step of the process along the way, as opposed to here where it's kind of assumed that you are learning it on your own without these checkpoints and so it's a little bit scary coming into it because you just get a reading list and you get deadlines. And these deadlines are usually months in advance. And so it's just assumed that you are creating your own schedule of learning these things by reading these books consistently. And I'm not used to that. I'm used to having someone kind of over my back saying, you have to turn this in, so therefore you have to read it by Thursday. And then it's kind of guided for you. Um, and that is probably the reason why the first term I did not do nearly as much reading as I was supposed to do. Um, but in retrospect, I don't really regret it because I was doing fun social things in place of that. So, um, yeah, I would say that there's, it's more independent working here. And, um, generally, more distant relationships between student and professor. So it is normal to meet with your supervisor, of course, but scheduling a meeting just for the sake of interest or um, if it's slightly related to your topic with a professor who isn't your supervisor seems a little bit bizarre here as far as I can tell. Whereas at Columbia, professors were willing to meet with students all the time. And I don't know if it's a matter of people being more busy here or it's a cultural difference, but um, yeah, having open office hours, for example, that's not something that professors here have as far as I've uh, been aware. Or they'll usually say email me, but then it might be hard to get in contact with them. But um, in the US, I didn't have that experience. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how, how different the, the two uh, courses are, because well, I did my undergraduate in, in London, which is also like in the UK system like I am now. And my undergraduate was fairly similar like to the masters here. Mm -hmm. So we had the same like essay, I don't know, deadlines far ahead and reading list. And, and in that sense, it was, it was similar to, to this course. So maybe like academically for me, it's been like an easy, easier, I don't know, transfer. But what I find really different is uh, well, living in a small town, although mm -hmm. I'm from like a similar sized town, but I feel like doing my undergrad in London, moving here, I feel like this is the most, uh, sort of like the biggest difference uh, between like London and Cambridge. And I just thought, because you did your undergrad in New York, and well, I haven't been, but what I understand, New York and London are kind of comparable. Mm -hmm. And um, so, how is like moving from New York to Cambridge? Still? It's very different. So academic systems are one thing, but th the city itself is totally different. I mean, I think it's pretty funny to me as a New Yorker when people refer to Cambridge as a city, just because it doesn't seem like it's a city at all. It seems more like a village. Um, but it is technically a city. I mean, there's a, there's a lot going on, but it's almost entirely, as far as I can tell, based around the university. And so if the University of Cambridge weren't in Cambridge, I don't, I don't have a concept for what Cambridge would look like at all, as opposed to in New York. If Columbia was not in New York, New York would continue to exist in the exact same way that it does today, uh, with maybe more buildings or shops in that area. Um, and so that was a huge difference. And I definitely find um, myself going into London somewhat frequently just kind of to get a breath of fresh air which I think is confusing to most people who would have the opposite where the city becomes overwhelming and so you move out into a less populated stuffy area but I kind of enjoy and find 
peaceful, the hecticness of the city. At least it's what I'm used to. And so Cambridge can feel small, but it's also incredibly beautiful and great to have a place where each building has a history, like an actual history, and some of which have been around for many centuries and have been used by, I don't know, super important people. It's, that tradition is can't be found at all in New York, let alone the U.S., um, given the fact that the U.S. is a baby compared to King's College at Cambridge, you know. Um, so that's, that's very cool. Okay, so you're here on uh, Gates Scholarship. Uh, tell us a bit about what is, what is Gates? Sure. How did, you, how did you get it? So the Gates Scholarship is a scholarship that funds master's and PhD students uh, for their entire time here, which is amazing. It covers um, the funds or the price of your uh, university fee, so for all your course, and in addition, maintenance fee, so your housing, your food, and whatnot. Um, but then they have other great things where if you're going to a conference, they will fund that, your transport, and whatnot. Um, so it's really generous, and it is meant for students who are trying to help the world in some way. So I know that's obviously a vague um, statement, but Basically, your research should be, to some degree, focused on helping others in the long term. And it's a wonderful community because all of these people really care about their research and the effects of their research. Um, I've found some of my best friends to be in the Gates community, and it's wonderful. Um, in terms of how I applied in that process, I went to my um, undergraduate department of like studying abroad and fellowships and in the beginning of my fourth year, final year, and said, I had just come back from this uh, research in Cameroon and was super eager to do more linguistics research. So I talked to him about master's degrees and he told me, well, most of the deadlines have passed, but there was one, which was the Gates Cambridge uh, scholarship, which hadn't. And the deadline was, I think, four days from when I had that meeting. So quickly, I rushed home, uh, sent out an application to Cambridge. Luckily, they required only writing samples that I had already done, which was very convenient. And heard back from the school that I had gotten into the program about a month or two after I applied, which was very relieving, but I knew that I wasn't going to go if I didn't get any funding, and heard back that I got an interview from Gates, I believe, in December or January, and then that was in Seattle, so I was in New York at the time, and so I went to Seattle and had an intimidating but honestly fun interview in which three different Cambridge professors sat down with me and asked me questions about what I'm interested in and my research. And it was, they were not trying to trick me at all. They were not um, trying to make me uncomfortable or stumping me and asking me whether I've read this text or this text or anything like that. They were just genuinely interested in what I was interested in. And so that made for a super easy interview that um, I just went through why I felt like what I was studying was important. And I, of course, thought I bombed it afterwards. And I left really sad because I was like, I did not come across well at all. And they probably think I'm an idiot. Um, but somehow I got it. And so now I'm here. And I'm so grateful for the fact that um, they chose me because I don't think I would be here if I didn't get it. That's the full story. Yeah. <laughs> So what would you what would you say to uh, people who are maybe now in their final or well if they're on their final year then they probably missed most deadlines but yeah. not on their final year <laughs> then but the year before and they're like considering whether they should continue like graduate education or not. It's I, I couldn't recommend it more. Even though this is intense and it's sometimes hard to be abroad. Um, Overall, 
the lifestyle is so great because you're learning things you care about, learning about things you care about. Um, the schedule is wonderful. Like I mentioned, I'm in class only four hours a week as opposed to a nine to five job five days a week. And nine to five even today is an unrealistic and I would say an underestimate of how much time people tend to spend at their jobs. And you are surrounded by people who are so fascinating and fascinated by whatever they're studying. And yeah, I don't know. I can't really get enough of the university lifestyle. And I'm excited to try living outside of it just to see what it's like. But what I know is that being in a university, focusing on something that you really care about is a wonderful way to be. So what are your plans for the, for the future? For you, when your, your course finishes now in, in a few months, what, what, what are you gonna do next? So I was considering applying to PhDs for the next year, but having just come from undergrad and having never really had a full-time job for more than a summer, um, I figured it would be a worthwhile thing to do. I don't anticipate to enjoy it very much, <laughs> but I would rather know that I don't like it mm -hmm. rather than assume that I don't like it and mm -hmm. just not enter the field. Um, also, despite university life being amazing for all the reasons that I mentioned, it, it can be difficult to have deadlines constantly, and I, working is seems to be difficult in a completely different way, but it'll be nice to just have a change of pace. and. So I'm going to apply for jobs, either in London or maybe somewhere in the US to be determined. And then for the following year, most likely start applying for PhD positions because I'm pretty certain at this point that that is what I want to spend my life doing. That's great. Do you, do you know what, um, like what would be your, well, not dream job, but the job that you would like to do then now for a year, or what sort of like? Because I imagine that, well, it's something connected to what you have studied. Mm -hmm. So, have you thought about what, where would that be, or what are you gonna do with uh, after graduating from MPhil in linguistics, mm -hmm. with um, within like mainly computational linguistics or uh, syntax? What can you do after, or what would you like to do? with this degree for the next year? So, because I've kind of been um, inundated with all of the information of exciting things that are happening with computational linguistics today, mm -hmm. and when I say today, I like literally mean today, like there are fields in which uh, you learn about contemporary topics of say, the 2000s, but that's not really changing so much today. But the exciting thing about this field is that people don't know, uh, like they haven't solved problems like uh, AI and natural language processing or computational linguistics is totally relevant to that kind of thing. And so even though I won't necessarily be doing research, I would love to be involved in something that is trying to answer questions that have yet to be answered. And so I'm looking at some tech companies and seeing what kind of work they're doing and whether my interest in um, basically expanding resources for different languages or languages with different amount of data um, would be interested in me. <laughs> and beyond that, um, also some groups, organizations that focus on documentation as a process. That's the nice thing about doing the kind of Cameroon related work that I did earlier is that you don't have to be at a university if that's something you're interested in. So there are tons of nonprofits that are documenting languages um, with and without actually going to the places. So in cities like New York and London, you have such linguistic diversity because people are coming there from all around the world that speakers are local, which is wonderful. And so I would consider getting involved in one of those. The problem with those is that they're pretty small and so they're not necessarily looking for um, new people to hire and who they can pay. <laughs> um, but 
yeah, I'm just gonna kind of dip my toes in all kinds of linguistic related things. So that is the that is the rough plan. And next year you'd be applying, or then no, already this year you'd be applying for PhDs for next year. Correct. Do you know um, where? So these days I'm missing the U.S. for a number of reasons, in particular my home city of New York. But I think the experience of working in a different place, even if it's just for a few months before I have to put in my applications, will give me some better um, idea of how much I would like to be in back in the U.S., whether I need to. Because as fun as it has been living in a different place, I don't know that I could commit to a full PhD degree in which I wasn't home for that entire time. Um, so if I had to guess, I would say there's a 60% chance that I will pursue something in New York, but who knows? In this, uh, on the same topic? On the same topic. Unless I am swept away by something else, but this seems just like a field in which there's so much more to be done, and so I would like to do that. That's great. Do you, do you know, in, in like long run, would you like to stay in academia? Not that you have to have it figured out, but I'm just like, what are your thoughts on that, like academia versus the industry? It's, it's tough to say. I, th- I come from like a family of teachers. Everyone in my family was or is a teacher to some degree. And so I feel like I have those skills kind of innately in me. And so I think I would like to try um, teaching at some point, in which case being in academia is a very easy way to do that. And as far as I can tell, a lot of professors tend to prefer research to teaching. And I don't think I would necessarily feel inclined in that regard. So I would love to try teaching. Um, So academia is a definite maybe. I would say, yeah. <laughs> That's a great way to, to put it. <laughs> <laughs> so to anyone who um, just uh, got interested in linguistics, like right now, mm-hmm. uh, how would you, like with no background in linguistics or just Googled what is linguistics and thought that, oh, this is quite interesting, how would you suggest that they go on? Like, how would you, how would you get into linguistics or how did you find it? Or are there any like materials or... Mm. I don't know, websites, books, or whatever ways to, fun, easy ways to, I don't know, introduce yourself to linguistics. I think there are tons of ways to do that. Um, If you're at a university, highly recommend taking just the intro course, because the intro course will span all different fields, as I mentioned. Um, And so you can see which ones are interesting to you. It's going to be a survey by definition, which is um, very exciting. Um, but if you're not in the university, there are definitely ways to do that. Um, I think just getting other language experience is super useful. So using apps like Duolingo and stuff like that on a daily basis can be both so fun. And you're going to pick up linguistic concepts just by virtue of learning a language that is different from your own. You know, um, you might not be able to identify it as a syntactic movement or whatever but it that's what it is and if that kind of stuff excites you then might be interested in going to linguistics um books tons of books um i would say that the language instinct by steven pinker was one that really drew me in um it goes into linguistics from kind of a psycholinguistics angle and is very relatable so someone with no background can definitely get into it and he's super smart slightly controversial harvard professor so um definitely a name worth knowing um yeah i don't know those those would be my baseline suggestions but there's there's so many ways googling what is linguistics is honestly not a bad way to start definitely okay um do you have Would you like to add anything? Uh, talk about anything else? Um, give some advice or? I don't think so. Um, <laughs> I think it's kind of well. Maybe it's been covered, but yeah, no. Being a master's student is a fun time. I would say so. I would recommend that, and 
Oh, one thing I think I would say is that I think people are often surprised by how how large uh, an academic subject can technically be defined. So people can have interest in something like m- m- TV and not realize that that can be an academic subject that you can actually go into and research at a university. Um, I know someone who is writing their PhD thesis on Moana, the movie, the Disney movie. Um, And so if you're interested by something, which I think everyone is, maybe consider doing it at a university because there are people who are interested in it too and hobbies are not just hobbies, they can be more than that, is what I would say. This is a great uh, enthusiastic note to end an interview on. Thank you very much. Thank you. This was very fun.